good morning class and welcome to another lecture in uh, sustainable energy technology in the previous class we have started our discussion on biomass and bioenergy based energy uh, technologies and we uh, ended our discussion in the last class on various types of commercial biomass including liquid biomass biofuels like bioethanol and biodiesel and biojet fuels solid biomass fuels like wood pellets and gaseous biomass fuels like biogas we also discussed the important concept of the net energy ratio which is the ratio of the energy that you are getting out of the biofuel by energy required to produce the biofuel or to generate the biofuel in the first place so in this context let us discuss the various types of biomass bio from different biomass sources and their relative advantages and disadvantages firstly we will look at two very common types of biofuels that are used in the transportation technology which is bioethanol and biodiesel now the interesting and the challenging aspect of biomass energy systems is there is a wide variety of biomass sources that is available to be transformed into usable biofuels solid gaseous or liquid so if you look at ethanol for example you can produce ethanol from uh, uh, crops like corn or sugarcane or you can produce ethanol from a type of grass like switchgrass okay so uh, basically what you do in this case and we will see later that we use a sort of fermentation process by which we ferment the sugars that is there in corn syrup or sugarcane syrup or in the switchgrass uh, the carbohydrates that are present in switchgrass and convert them into ethanol and it matters that we are sourcing your biofuel from which type of biomass resource so for example if you are using corn then to grow corn harvest corn and then ferment corn sugar into ethanol you will typically uh, generate 81 to 85 kg of carbon dioxide per megajoule of energy okay which is a significant amount so you this uh, is not carbon neutral and the reason this is not carbon neutral is because you need fertilizers and the fertilizers are coming from chemical plants that are running on some sort of non renewable systems you need thermal energy you need uh, there are land use change issues if you are creating new crop lands from forest etc so all of these add up and create a positive co2 emissions per megajoule of energy that you are getting out of burning ethanol in your transportation system so one megajoule of energy obtained from burning ethanol will consume uh, will generate 81 to 85 kg of co2 to the atmosphere net co2 to the atmosphere the yield of corn based ethanol uh, in liters per hectare so this is liters of ethanol produced per hectare of land so hectare is a measure of the land area and the value is around 1135 liters to 1900 liters so per hectare of land your yield is around 1135 to 1900 liters of ethanol and the net energy ratio is also reasonably small around 1.1 or 1.25 so basically if you are investing 100 joules of energy to uh, generate your ethanol you are getting out around 110 to 125 joules of energy so this is a very energy intensive process and the energy gain is not that much okay one advantage is the technology is established so in us particularly corn ethanol is widely used uh, to generate uh, corn is widely used to generate ethyl alcohol for uh, biofuel production however as you can see from the other aspects of this system the actual economic and environmental advantage of corn based ethanol is extremely debatable now if you switch your feedstock and you go for sugar cane based ethanol okay so you have sugar cane juice and you are fermenting that sugarcane juice to produce ethyl alcohol in this case 
the amount of uh, CO2 emitted for the entire process of sugarcane growth, harvesting and conversion to ethanol is significantly lower, around 4 to 12 kg, kgs of CO2 per megajoule of energy. And this has been achieved in countries like Brazil because sugarcane is easier to grow, has higher yields and you can also use the waste that is coming out of sugarcane for and burn it for thermal process technology, uh, thermal energy requirements in your ethanol production itself. So as a result, sugarcane based ethanol production does not consume a lot of extra energy or resources from outside sources which requires carbon dioxide, uh, fossil fuel based energy sources. Hence the CO2 emissions values are much lower compared to corn based ethanol sources. The yields are also in correct countries and uh, climates is much larger. 5,300 to 6,500 liters of ethanol can be generated per hectare of land. So you are getting around five times increase in, uh, in the total yield of, sugar, of sugarcane based ethanol per hectare of land. So the land use requirements are also much lower. And this reflects in the net energy ratio as well. So the net energy ratio is 8 to 10. So you are getting 10 times as many units of energy from burning ethanol that is coming from sugarcane juice compared to what you are investing to produce the ethanol from sugarcane. So this sugarcane to ethanol makes a extremely good environmental economic sense. Okay, and the technology is established as well. So these two established technologies shows that uh, getting biofuel is not enough. How you are getting biofuel is what matters. So ethanol coming from corn is not as biofriendly or eco-friendly as ethanol coming from sugarcane. Switchgrass is a, uh, another type of uh, plant material. So it's kind of a grass that is fast growing grass that can grow on marginal lands. So, it, so switchgrass growth is usually done on lands which are not very arable. So it does not compete with uh, with good arable land for food production. So switchgrass is kind of an advanced biofuel resource that you can use to generate ethanol in an even more eco-friendly manner. And this kind of shows up in the amount of CO2 emitted as well. So here you have minus 24 kgs of CO2 being emitted per megajoule of uh, energy released by ethanol coming from switchgrass. And the reason here is that you are growing this switchgrass in what is actually barren lands. So it's kind of a grass that grows in arid lands. You need no fertilizers, nothing. Okay. And part of that grass uh, gets sequestered in the ground, like the root systems and everything. So part of the grass that is being grown remains in the ground and, uh, uh, and acts as a sink of CO2 into the ground. Right. So you are adding no extra energy that is CO2 intensive and part of the sewage grass is uh, coming into the ground and hence CO2 is being actively removed from the atmosphere. So switch grass based systems has a negative carbon dioxide balance per megajoule which is extremely useful. The yields per hectare is not as much. It's uh, obviously the arable of uh, the land is not very arable. So you get 2700 to 5000 liters per hectare of ethanol produced from switch grass production. And the net energy ratio is somewhat lower around 1.8 to 4.4. Because the yields are somewhat low. The current technology here is in the pilot plant stage. So large scale commercial production has not happened. But pilot scale demonstrations uh, by companies who are researching this technology has happened. Okay. Now if you look at biodiesel case. For biodiesel also it can come from multiple types of uh, resources. It can come from soybean oil. It can come from rapeseed oil or it can come from algal oil. Soybean oil and rapeseed oil are vegetable oils. So in that sense, it competes with the food generation when you are using that oil, not for cooking purposes, but for generating fuels like biodiesel. Okay. So that is a uh, concern when, when it comes to sustainability. The amount of CO2 generation is also therefore significant. You are getting 49 to 37 kgs of CO2 that is being generated per megajoule of energy generated by burning this biodiesel. So these are again traditional crops. So you need fertilizers, land, everything and those have a CO2 footprint. 
the yield per hectare is also quite different for these two cases so for example for soybean oil it's quite low 225 to 300 liters per hectare for rapeseed oil it's quite high around 2700 the net energy ratios are also vary uh, it is primarily varying because uh, what happens for soybean oil particularly once you press the oil the uh, soybean shell that is being used that can be uh, converted into uh, uh, that can be burnt in a furnace to generate heat and electricity required to convert and perform this uh, conversion from soybean oil to biodiesel so that's why even though the yields are low the net energy ratio can be high especially if the waste soybean pods etc are used for energy generation rapeseed oil does not have as much of waste so its energy ratios are somewhat smaller so these are two are established technologies okay uh, one upcoming technology is algae based biodiesel so this is basically uh, uh, harvested in kind of uh, artificial tanks uh, where you are putting a water you are getting open sunlight and the algae is growing in these artificial tanks when you put some nutrients okay so these kinds of growth does not require a lot of land and does not require soil at all and it can also often tolerate brackish water or waste water these kinds of algae so it may be a, a good option whenever uh, especially because it does not compete with arable land and even does not compete with the fresh water which is also in short supply in many parts of the world and the CO2 sequestration is very large because you are not using any traditional land or fertilizers. You are growing algae and part of this algae is sequestering the CO2 uh, uh, because you are only extracting the algal oil and the algae cells can be uh, buried and the CO2 hence removed from the ground that way. The yield per hectare, these are experimental values. Uh, the actual values may be far very different because this is still a, a laboratory based technology. So this kind of gives you the potential yield once this, uh, this technology has received, uh, the research on this technology has reached maturation. So this is a, uh, a growing area of research. Okay. Uh, some of my students also is working on extracting oil from these kinds of autotrophic bacteria and algae and trying to see whether these uh, uh, algal oils can generate biodiesel in good quantities. So this is a topic of active research by many researchers in this field. And hence, these yields are you can think of as potential yields rather than actual yields that are seen in the laboratory scale. Okay. So, you can see that net energy ratios varies a lot. And one note of caution in this point, if you see different reports, you will also get very different estimates of this net energy ratios or the CO2 yields, CO2 emissions or the yields. Because these things depend a lot on the way you are using the land, the way you are growing the crops or the algae, way you are harvesting them and when you are processing them. So it's very site specific, process specific, technology specific and hence different papers when reviewing results often come to different conclusions regarding these yields, CO2 emissions and net energy ratio. So you need to be sensitive about those aspects. So this kind of shows how uh, you can use different feedstocks to get different types of biofuels and how that impacts the sustainability and the greenhouse gas impact of these biofuels. Now we will look at some of the uh, ways, some of the major properties of the biofuels when you are uh, using them as combustion sources. So the most important property is what is called heating value, which is how much heat is being liberated when you burn 1 kg of that substance. Okay. So for example, anthracite coal has a heating value of 32,000. Methane has a heating value of 50 to 60,000. This is all in kilojoules per kg. So you can compare uh, these solid biomass materials with anthracite coal, which is a very classic fossil fuel based solid fuel. Okay. So you can see if you look at rice husk, which is the shell of the rice pods basically, this when dried has a heating value of 39. 13,900 kilojoules per kg or around 14,000 kilojoules per kg. When it's wet, the moisture absorbs a lot of the heat that has been generated and this cannot contribute effectively. So the wet rice hulls has a heating value of 9,000, around 9,000 kilojoules per kg. When you look at uh, another kind of a waste 
agricultural agrarian resource which is bagas it's the waste from uh, sugarcane uh, processing so uh, sugarcane processing bagas it, it can also be dry or it can be wet and dry sugarcane bagas has 17,000 kilojoules per kg of energy wet sugarcane bagas has 11,000 kilojoules per kg of energy so in these cases when sugarcane bagas is available you are using the sugarcane bagas itself to generate the power and the heat needed for to run your process of trans transforming sugarcane juice into ethanol so that is why using this improves the net energy ratio improves the yield and improves the sustainability of the process so you should use this in, for those purposes then you have dry wood which is around 18.5 megajoules per kg then wood chips which is 13.6 megajoules per kg uh, corn stover again a waste from corn uh, agriculture dry is around 17500 wet is around 12000 municipal solid waste uh, this is kind of the waste material that is collected by the municipality from various houses and homes it has a much lower heating value of 4000 to 8000 kilojoules per kg and you can compare all of this to anthracite coal which whose heating value is 32000 kilojoules per kg so what it means is when you burn anthracite coal 1 kg of it you will get 32000 kilojoules of energy so you can see when you compare coal with various biomass, clearly biomass has much lower specific energy content, that is energy content per unit mass compared to coal. So when you are trying to replace coal with solid biomass like wood pellets, etc., you need to keep this in mind that you will need to add more uh, uh, biomass material than you would necessarily require to add coal to generate the same amount of energy because biomass materials are, have lower energy than coal. Now, we also discussed different types of feedstock. Uh, now, the renewability of these feedstocks is also an issue because it takes some time for the crops to grow, for the trees to mature, etc. So, this uh, table kind of shows you the different bio biomass types and the typical number of years it takes to regenerate a biomass resource once it has been consumed to generate biofuels or bioenergy systems. So, one is uh, like switchgrass, corn, sugarcane so these three things right here so these take typically half a year or six months to regenerate so the turnover time is quick so you can get two crops and hence two batches of ethanol per year if you now go from uh, uh, grasses and crops to uh, wood you can have different types of wood you can have fast fast growing timber so these are usually used in agroforestry industry where they have these plantations of fast growing trees that mature fast which you can cut down to use it for wood material. So these fast growing timbers take two to three years to regenerate. When you look at forest timber however, it takes 25 years for forest timber to regenerate and if you are going from temperate or polar regions, colder regions, it may take 91 years for forest timbers to regenerate. And the, uh, uh, one ton, so this 1000 kgs of municipal solid uh, uh, waste is renewed uh, per person, is renewed in every 1.2 years. So this is the renewal rate of these biomass resources. So you, based on this, you can know that once you harvest a resource from a certain area or a certain domain, how long it will take before that resource is filled up again by natural processes. So that is the impact of this biomass feedstock. Okay, I will... Uh, uh, stop here. We will continue in the next class. Thank you.